If you have an old console that you want to connect to a modern TV, then you might have run into a few problems. Many new TVs still have the old red, white and yellow analog inputs you're probably familiar with, but not all TVs recognize the low resolution signal that older consoles output. And even when they do, the way they handle this signal isn't always great. The good news is, the RetroTINK 2X provides a simple solution that not only allows you to play your old consoles on a modern TV, it also upscales the resolution and does this with almost no latency. At 150 bucks though, you might be wondering, is it really worth it? There are plenty of cheaper options available on eBay that claim to do the same thing, so why spend the extra money? Getting old consoles to run properly on modern displays is unfortunately a complex subject. While there are a number of excellent videos from channels like My Life in Gaming that explain this topic in great detail, they're not always that succinct. So I thought, along with a review of the retro tint, I'd also give you a layman's explanation on how to navigate some of this stuff. This will be particularly useful if you're just getting into retro gaming and or aren't very knowledgeable on the topic. Also, if you're wondering if the RetroTINK works with an Elgato capture card, then the short answer is yes, albeit with a couple of caveats. But I'll cover that in more detail too. And one final thing just before we get into it, I'll be talking specifically about the RetroTINK 2X version 3.2 in this video. As of July 2019, it's the most current iteration of the device and has a few improvements over the older models. One of the first things you'll notice about the RetroTINK 2X is its basic design and exposed PCB. Don't let this fool you into thinking it isn't well made though. Despite requiring some assembly, it's a solid little piece of tech. It's not complicated to put together either, you don't even need tools. I put mine together in a few minutes using only my fingers. It's incredibly compact too, which means that it's not too hard to hide if the appearance isn't to your taste. I personally like the raw tech look, but I can see how this might be an issue for some. There is a case that you can either print yourself for free, or if you don't own a 3D printer, you can buy from sites like LaserBear. The case also makes the buttons a bit more accessible. I have pretty small carnival sized hands, so they're not a problem for me, but if you have big fat fingers, then the buttons might be a little bit fiddly. One pitfall of the compact design is that it has connection ports on all four sides. This makes it kind of hard to organize neatly when it's all wired up. It's definitely a minor gripe, but if appearances matter to you, this is something to be aware of. As I've previously mentioned, the three supported input types are composite, that's the yellow cable, S-Video, which is the weird looking connector, and component, which is the red, green, and blue cables. Composite cables are the most common with older systems, but provide the lowest quality. S-Video provides a noticeable increase in image fidelity, and component cables are even better still. Some consoles support more than one type, so depending on the system, you might be able to use better cables to get a better picture. I'll cover this in more detail in the how-to section later on though. The RetroTINK 2X supports 240p and 480i, as well as 288i and 576i resolutions, which means it'll work with both NTSC and PAL consoles. It also supports PAL 60Hz signals, so if you're in a PAL region like here in Australia or the UK, then you're fully covered. Compatibility with PAL seemed to be a concern with some of the earlier RetroTINK models, but I've had zero problems with anything I've thrown at it. I've added a list of consoles I've tested and the types of connections I've used in the description if you want more detail. As the 2X in the name suggests, the RetroTINK 2X doubles the lines of resolution it receives, which is how it upscales the image. You can turn this off if you simply want the native resolution converted into a digital signal. This is useful if you plan on getting super nerdy and running the RetroTINK in tandem with something else like an OSSC, which doesn't support composite or S-Video natively. The other display option you can toggle is smoothing. This softens the entire image, which can be useful for fixing rough looking edges. The effect won't be to everyone's taste and it definitely works better with some games than others, but swapping back and forth is easy enough with the press of a button. I prefer to leave it off when playing 2D games because I like my pixels as crispy as possible. In 3D games, and in particular early polygon based games, the effect can be pretty good at reducing aliasing, otherwise known as the jaggies. It's also pretty good at fixing visible dithering. Back in the olden days when we used to play on CRTs, the low resolution and scan lines of these displays would hide a lot of these imperfections. Modern high resolution displays though unfortunately hide nothing, exposing all of these flaws. Again, smoothing works better on some consoles than others. On the N64 and PS1 for example, it generally looks pretty good with most games, whereas I've had less dramatic results on the PS2. 
you do lose a bit of sharpness with it set to on. So things like menu text can end up looking a little bit funky. And this makes it unsuitable for games with a large focus on text, such as RPGs. This is all very subjective, of course, but it's a nice feature all the same. The official RetroTINK site claims roughly 53 milliseconds of latency. In normal English, this translates into an almost non-existent delay between the signal leaving your console and being sent to your TV. You might think that this is the least impressive feature, but you'd be completely wrong. You see, latency will add a delay between when you press a button and when something happens on the screen. This can make games feel unresponsive, and given that so many games from the 8 and 16-bit era demand fast reactions and pinpoint accuracy, adding any kind of delay can make them very frustrating to play. It's worth mentioning that the RetroTINK won't eliminate other types of latency, like the delay your TV might add when processing images, but you can at least be sure that you're not introducing any additional latency into your setup. This is one of the biggest issues that you'll typically come across with the cheaper alternatives. So let's talk about those cheaper units and why I think the RetroTINK is a far superior product. I've had this HD upscaler for a few years now and it set me back about $50. It gives you the option of upscaling to either 720p or 1080p, although it only supports composite and S-video inputs. The picture it generates is surprisingly crisp. Here's a comparison using composite, with the video converter set to 1080 versus the RetroTINK's 480 resolution. You can see how the video converter generates a much sharper image, which is particularly impressive given how shit composite signals generally are. Okay, so you're probably thinking based on this comparison, why the hell would I buy the Tink over something like this? Well, unfortunately, upscaling the resolution is about the only thing this converter does well. You've probably already noticed how washed out the color looks, but more annoyingly, it only supports a 16x9 image. Given that the vast majority of older consoles output at 4x3 or a similar ratio, this results in stretched images. You can, of course, simply force the ratio to 4x3 if your TV allows it, but this creates a big problem if you want to record gameplay or use it for streaming. I've manually forced it to 4x3 for this video, but this is normally what it outputs. The biggest problem though is how laggy it is, and for this reason it's obvious that playing games was not a consideration when it was designed. When you combine the lag with the ratio issues, it can make playing games through it a real chore. The other thing to consider with these types of converters is that just like some displays, some of them mishandle the 240p signal as 480i, which results in weird jank. If you simply want a cheap solution to connect your old console to a TV that doesn't have analog inputs and you aren't too fussed with the end result, then these cheap units are an option. They definitely have their limitations though, and if you want to actually enjoy your old games, then spending the extra money is well worth it if you ask me. Another requirement that people often have with older systems is being able to capture gameplay for either recording or streaming. If you've ever tried to capture gameplay through an Elgato using Component, you might have noticed that while you get an image on your TV, it doesn't display through the capture software. This is due to a problem with 240p over Component that the Elgato doesn't support. I can happily report that the RetroTINK 2X version 3.2 does allow 240p capture through an Elgato. You don't even need the older model that has the analog cable adapter either, as the RetroTINK outputs via HDMI. There is one slight issue in that you'll get desyncs on some games that swap between different resolutions. The PS1 logo startup sequence, for example, is rendered at a different resolution to most games. This results in a momentary drop out of picture, and when this happens, it can end your current recording. In my experience though, the capture software usually just resumes recording once the picture returns, creating a new capture file in the same folder. So the only real downside apart from a second or two without an image is that you end up with multiple capture files. Something missing on the RetroTINK that a lot of other upscalers offer is scan lines. Some people feel that this is an essential part of the retro experience, and I totally get that. I've never really liked the faux scan line look myself, but if it's something you can't live without, then that's certainly worth bearing in mind. The RetroTINK 2X is an excellent solution for anyone who's looking for a simple way to play their old systems on a modern TV. If you don't want to mess around with configuration settings or spend a lot of money, there really isn't anything in this price bracket that's comparable. I'd argue that this is really the entry point for decent analog to digital processing and scaling. While products like the OSSC do provide more options and high levels of scaling, they also come with significantly higher prices and can often require a bit of tinkering to get the most out of them. There are a huge number of cheaper alternatives, but you will have to compromise on quality, both in terms of image fidelity and latency. For this reason, the RetroTINK 2X is an easy product to recommend and a perfect place to start if you're just getting into retro gaming.
So if you are thinking about getting into retro gaming, or you've just started your journey, you probably have loads of questions like, which cable should I use? How do I manage multiple systems? And is there anything else that I should know to get the best possible picture? Beyond adding a retro tink or any kind of upscaler to your setup, there are a number of other variables that can have a really big impact on picture quality. The most important thing for getting a good picture, arguably even more so than using an upscaler, is having high quality cables. This is both in terms of the quality of the cable itself and the type of signal it carries. So let's cover which type of cables provide the best signal quality first. In terms of image quality, RF cables are the worst and it's best to avoid them if you can. This isn't always possible though. The Sega Master System Mark II, for example, only supports RF out because apparently Sega hates you. So you either have to deal with it or look into an RF to AV converter. I haven't personally had any experience with these, but just like upscalers, there are some cheap options on eBay if you're willing to take a gamble. Composite is the next best after RF, although the quality through these still isn't great. Unfortunately, this will again be your only option with some systems, like PAL versions of the N64. Your only other option for a better image in this case is getting your console modified, but that's a topic for a whole other video. S-Video is the next step up in fidelity and it's a big leap over composite. It's pretty well supported too, and it's usually not that expensive, making it a good option if your console supports it. Component is a nice step above S-Video quality, although the upgrade isn't quite as dramatic. Support, particularly in NTSC regions like North America, is a bit limited though. The price of decent component cables does start to get on the expensive side of things too. Good cables for the PS2 start from around $30, which isn't too bad, although the HD RetroVision cables that I use for my Mega Drive and my GameCube are around $90. I personally think that the quality that these cables provide totally justifies the cost, but you may not want to spend that much. SCART is generally considered to be the gold standard because it carries the RGB signal. If you truly want the best picture, then this is the format to look into. It also has pretty decent support across a number of consoles, although it's easily the most expensive and complicated path to pursue if you live outside of Europe. There also isn't many options for SCART switch boxes, and you can't use it with the RetroTINK, so you'd have to look into other scalers like the OSSC. I personally chose to go for Component over SCART because I don't think the improvement that SCART provides is worth the additional hassle, and it's well supported for power consoles like the GameCube. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that many systems support more than one option when it comes to cables, such as the Mega Drive. It originally came with RF, but it also supports Composite as well as Component and SCART. It's definitely worth doing some research on which outputs are supported by your console before buying cables for it. Each console is unique, and there are differences between regions and even between different model numbers of the same console. The Super Nintendo, N64 and GameCube, for example, all appear to take the same cable. And while they do all support composite, S-Video and component support varies. I've stuck a link to a couple of really useful articles below that explain which type of outputs specific consoles support. I also highly recommend checking out My Life in Gaming's RGB200 Masterclass series for each system to figure out what your options are. On top of picking a cable type, you also need to make sure that the cables you have are well made. Official cables, like the ones that came with your system, are usually pretty good, but that doesn't mean that you can't get better. Unfortunately, there are tons of crappy cables on sites like Amazon and eBay, and as I've mentioned before, you get what you pay for. If you want to make sure that you're getting top shelf, you typically need to look at retro gaming enthusiast sites like Castlemania Games, Retro Gaming Cables, Retro Access, and HD Retrovision. Now, if you have more than one console in your setup, then using a switch box will allow you to connect them all to the one display. I personally have two switch boxes, one for my composite consoles and one for my component systems. This means that with a press of a button, I can send the signal from the console that I want to play to my RetroTINK without having to rewire anything. Like cables, it's important to go for quality equipment here because cheaply made switches can degrade the signal and introduce latency. There's no point investing in expensive cables for your consoles to then plug them into something that converts the signal into poop. The good news is, is that AV switch boxes are easy enough to come by and they're also pretty cheap. You can get lucky and find premium and professional units for sale secondhand too, as a lot of high-end setups have migrated over to digital hardware. If you're looking for something top shelf, then you might want to look at the G-Comp and G-SCART switches. These have been specifically designed with gaming in mind and will automatically switch to the active signal, meaning you don't have to memorize or label buttons. Unsurprisingly, the connecting cables you use to connect switches to scalers and to TVs are important too. 
Just like with everything else, you can find both RCA and SCART cables pretty cheaply on eBay, but cheap doesn't usually mean good. What you want to look for is build quality and also that it's properly shielded. Stay clear of thin cables with cheap looking connectors. I've been pretty happy with monster cables and I think they're a good place to start if you're unsure what to look for. I'm not saying that they're the best, but it's pretty hard to go wrong with their stuff. HDMI cables are far less complicated. Pretty much anything will do for retro gaming purposes, but to avoid compatibility issues with newer consoles and TVs, such as 4K displays, you'll want to get cables that support 18 gigabits per second and 4K at 60 hertz. Lots of HDMI cables claim to be fast or 4K ready, but unless they state these specific specs, a lot of the time this is pure bullshit. The last piece of advice I have is to get yourself a surge protected power board. Retro gaming is only going to get more expensive as the hardware becomes increasingly difficult to find, so taking care of your equipment now will save you both money and disappointment in the future. I have a Belkin branded one, which again I'm not suggesting are the best, but I've always been happy with the quality of their products. This one also came with a replacement warranty on connected equipment if anything should go wrong, so I'd recommend going for something similar if that's available. Okay, so that wraps up this brief hardware tutorial. I've really only scratched the surface of each topic and there's plenty more nuance to everything I've discussed. So if you have questions, drop them down below and I'll do my best to help you out. I've left a shit ton of information and links in the description on just about everything I've talked about and if you'd like me to cover any topic in more detail, just let me know. Anyway, I hope this has been useful. Thanks for watching and peace out.